That, that was really good, wasn't it? What a, what a wonderful thing to see our young people up here singing and praising God. I want to share with you this morning the sermon. And I've, just for a start, I want to relay a story to you that was told to me. The young boy played under the old high block house. He was only three years old. He had a big crop of white curly hair. His, his mother had never ever cut his hair. And as he played, he thought, I will go to my father. He's down there in the mango orchard. I'll go down where he is and join him. As he got up and walked out from under the house, he walked through the little citrus grove. There was 16 fruit trees. There was pomelos and grapefruit and mandarin and oranges and lemons and kumquat. And as he walked further on, the grass started to get longer. And the grass was about a metre and a half high. The, it had been a good season, the rain had grown the grass, and his father was down there somewhere. So the boy walked into the long grass, not worried about what was there. He wanted to go to his father. And as he walked in, it wasn't long before he came head on to a team of horses. There was two big horses in the front and two behind with a plough. And he walked up to the shoulder of the horse. They stopped immediately, they dropped their head and they started to nuzzle the boy. And the father gave the command for the horses, giddy up. They didn't respond. So the father got off the plough and come, come around the front and there he saw the small boy. He picked him up and took him back to his house. That story was told to me by my mother and my father and I was a small boy in that story and that story happened 77 years ago. I want you to open the scriptures with me this morning to Luke 15. Luke chapter 15. And we'll start at verse 11. Luke 15 and verse 11. And he said... A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And he divided unto them his living. Now, friends, I don't know. Some time ago, Pastor Dragon took a sermon on the ten virgins, and there was new light. I'd understood that parable and never before. And when I thought about it, I thought, how often? We read these parables, we read the scriptures, and we don't really analyse what is going on. And that's why I picked on the prodigal son. Because I want to sh just share a few thoughts with you this morning. Now, it says that a rich man... Now, when I've always read the parable of the prodigal son, I've thought about a boy who said, give me my inheritance, Dad, and Dad said, oh, well, you know, shook the piggy bank out and he got a few dollars and away he went. But that's not the way it was. And I have come to realise I have a daughter, a son, grandsons, daughters, great-grandsons, great-granddaughters, and this father probably had his father before him owned the farm and probably his father before him. And here was this rich man and he had to divide the assets and really when you think about it it wasn't a few dollars if you take it in today's terms if my son and my daughter came to me and said dad give me what Joe me or what i want i would have to sell some of the farms or some of the properties some of the houses or whatever but this was a rich man i'm only a poor man and I know we had to divide the assets 
the properties, the livestock, the machinery, it would run into millions of dollars. Imagine how much this man had and how much this young boy received. You know, I just realized that it wasn't just a few dollars. He had virtually millions of dollars to spend. And he took his journey, and we'll just read on a bit further. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there rose a mighty famine in the land and he began to want. So it tells me there the boy was eager to go. He wanted to get his inheritance and leave, but he didn't leave for a few days. And I sort of feel, in, in my instance, the father would be going to the banks, to the money changers, to get enough money to buy the boy's portion, to give him his inheritance. It would be huge. It wasn't a few dollars. And then he went into a far land. Now, he didn't get there in a day or a week or a month. He had to walk in a far land, a long way away. And there he wasted his money on alcohol, on riotous living and parties, and on prostitutes. And you know, you say to, we might say as we look at that prodigal son, what a waster. Look what he's done. But I just wonder, are we any different? You know, we can sit here this morning in our sanctimonious state. We think we look good. We think everything's fine. And you say, I don't drink alcohol. Well, I hope you don't anyway. But have you ever been drunk with the things of this world? And you say, I don't party. But you probably enjoyed the good things of life. And then you say, yeah, but we don't, the men, we don't chase after prostitutes. The ladies, we don't chase after escorts. Well, I hope you don't anyway. But, friends, we are married to Jesus. Jesus and us in a marriage relationship. And how often do we turn against the Lord? Do we commit spiritual adultery in this case? Just think about it. Is the prodigal son such a waster after all? Or is the prodigal son us? I don't know. You might see it different the way I see it. But as I analyse this this uh, piece about the prodigal son, I just realised how relevant that is to us. I first heard the story of this when I was a small boy in Sunday school. And that's a long time ago. And I've heard it hundreds and hundreds of times. I've heard it preached from the pulpit. But I've never had it, heard it pulled apart like this. And the more I thought about it, the more I realised just the prodigal son to me, it was someone else, but now it fits me. It's me that needs what the prodigal son needed. And it goes on to say, where am I? Um, he joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed his swine or his pigs. And when he came to himself, or we would say today, when he woke up to himself. You know, you ever said to someone, wake up to yourself. And this is what the, this boy done. He woke up to himself. And as he fed those swine, he said, here I am here. And as he probably stopped drinking alcohol, he didn't party. There was no prostitutes. He had no money. No one wanted him now. He spent all his money. And out in the country with the fresh air that he breathed in and out, his brain came back to normal and he started to think about things. And he thought, well, there's the servants of my father. They have good food to eat. They have a warm bed at night. And here I am lying out in the paddock. No one feeds me. No one looks after me. So he made the decision. I will go to my father. And what a wonderful decision that he made. He would go to his father and I believe that every day since that prodigal son had left home, the father would have sent the servants out, go, look down the road, and see if my boy is coming home. And they looked, and they looked, and they looked. 
but now he wasn't there. Then one day, there was, as the servants looked down the road, there was a homeless man, clothes all tattered and torn. He was emaciated, he had no food. He came a long way, he might have walked for a year, I don't know, it doesn't say, but he came from a far country. There was no buses to get on, there was no planes to fly in, he had to walk. But the father of the boy, he came out and he had a look. What the servant saw was just another homeless person, a swaggy, walking up the road. But the father saw his son. It didn't matter what state he was in. The father was not fooled by the camouflage. He knew it was his son. And we'll see what happened. He said he would arise and go to his father and he would tell his father he was no more worthy to be called a son. But he wasn't worried about what the father had. He just wanted what the servants of his father had. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and we know the story how it goes on I was going to bring another section this morning out of the scriptures about but I'll leave that go I haven't got time so I'll leave that out I'll talk another day anyway I want you to look at John 14 John 14 verses 12 and verse 28 John 14 12 and 28. John 14, verse 12, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than this, these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And in verse 28, Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye love me, ye would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father. So there you are, my friends, as a small boy in the story, he wanted to go to his father. The prodigal son said, I will go to my father. And here, Jesus said, I will go to my father. The only difference with Jesus, he had to be crucified on Calvary before he could return to the Father. And it says there in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And you know, it, there's another beautiful quote in John 14.1-3. It says, Let not your heart be troubled, you believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And we know that Jesus has gone and that he will come again. There's a copy of the Constitution of the United States of America has been modified by an artist. So out of the pages shines the face of George Washington. And you know, friends, as we study God's Word, we study the Word of God, every page shines forth the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to turn with me to Revelation 3. And verses 18 to 21. Revelation 3, 18 to 21. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, 
that you may be rich, and white raiment that you may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness do not appear, and anoint your eyes with thyself that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. I just looked up a couple of things there and, you know, gold will melt at 1,064 degrees Celsius. But when gold is fired, they fire gold at 2,700 degrees Celsius. And the heat and the pressure brings forth out of that gold the dross, the scum, the rubbish, and that's trimmed off. And then we have pure, fine gold. And that's what God does to us. He trims our life. He fires us in the fire of affliction. He tests us. But at the end, to him that overcometh. And the only way we overcome is in Jesus. And you know, he says, he will cover us with the robe of his righteousness. He'll cover our spots, our faults. He will cover them. That's a wonderful thing to know, that Jesus will do this for us. About 50 years ago, in another life, I was a tomato farmer. And come September, in the tomato growing area, the, the crops just grow like wildfire. You stand in a tomato patch, and you can virtually hear the bushes grow. They grow that fast. From plant to fruit, eight weeks in the summertime. And they just virtually hear them creaking and squeaking, and that's in a healthy patch. This particular year was different. Been a lot of fog in August, and come September, the crop was devastated with spots and blemishes. They call it black spot. It was a large black spot on the stem. And what happens, the, the plant cannot take up the nutrients, the water and the trace elements it needs to produce the crop gets a crop on and it shrivels and dies. And there was panic stations in the district, there's 380, 60 or 80 farmers. They had meetings and they said, well, the only way to stop this is to plough the patches out, plough them all out. But you know, friends, somehow, some way, God let me know not to plough them out and what to do. And we put the boom spray on, we sprayed the anthracol chemical. The bushes looked white, and it strengthened up the thing. And then we went in with hose, and we hoed the soil up over the spots and the blemishes on the bushes, pulled the soil up. As a result, those bushes put new roots out below, above the spot. And they now had new life. They were covered, and the crop flourished. Come picking time or harvest time, we went in to harvest the crop and the first week, a thousand ten kilogram cartons, ten tonne of tomatoes, we brought into the packing shed, we coloured, we cooled and we sent them off the market and it was a new market. Melbourne had opened up for the first time, before that we couldn't use Melbourne market. So it was just a, a guest chance, send them to Melbourne. We sent the tomatoes to Melbourne, and those days, if you got 10 to $12, which we used to get occasionally, that was real good money. The agent, the agent rung up on a Tuesday morning, he said, a thousand cases, $20 a case. And friends, that mightn't sound much today, but in those days, if you equal it to now, it'd be like receiving 120 dollars $140 for a case of tomatoes. And that was just because we covered the faults, the sins in that crop. And that's what Jesus does to us. He covers our sins with his robe of his righteousness. That's his promise, promise to us today. You know, it says in 1 Peter 5, 8, Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil walketh about as a roaring lion, 
seeking whom he may devour. And we have to be careful that we are not one that gets led astray by Satan. I'd just like you to look at John 10, 7 to 11. John 10 and 7 to 11. John 10, verse 7. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. And you know, I didn't tell Pastor Dragon when I was talking about today, but there you are. The children's story was about the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door, by me if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that I might have life and might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. You know, friends, I will not stand on a sea of glass. I will not walk through the pearly gates. I will not receive eternal life except by the spilt blood of Christ Jesus on Calvary. There is no other way. If you have another way, I wish you well with that, because I don't think it's going to work. You know, today we have our society works on slips of paper. You need a slip of paper for this, and you have a blue card for that, and something else for something else. You know, where I come from, we don't have all those slips of paper. As a farmer, we just get about our business. We don't need slips of paper to do this, that or the other. But if someone comes to my place and they're going to do a chainsaw, they've got a slip of paper to say they can use the chainsaw. That's just the way society lives. And you know, in our life, we have, we have diplom we, we've earned diplomas over the years. Diplomas in agriculture and horticulture, animal husbandry, livestock management, land management, artificial breeding of cattle, all these things, dam making, fence alignment, yard, whatever. And they're things we've learnt because we've been doing it. And one morning, about 20 years ago, the phone rang and the man was called Sam. And Sam said, I said, yeah, what can I do for you, Sam? I didn't know who Sam was. He said, I'm the new bank manager in town. He said, I've been reading through your files. He said, I want to come have a talk. I said, fair enough. Any time, when to suit you? He said, when suits you? I said, whatever suits you. So Sam and I made an appointment and Sam came out. And we drove around and he was impressed with the livestock and the land management and what we were doing. And when we got back to the gate, Sam said to me, and he was looking for this slip of paper. Sam said to me, what about such and such? I said, Sam, I said, it's in the records. This was something else. He said, no, I've read this. He'd read all. He said, the file's this long. I said, yeah, I've been to the bank for 40 years, so it probably is. Anyway, he said, oh, by the way, I didn't see a budget. Did you receive a budget? I said, yeah, I did, actually. He said, it must have gone astray on the mail. I said, no. I said, I don't do budgets. I said, the budget come in the mail. I said, bank budget, waste paper bin. I've been doing this for 40 years. He said, you can't run a farm, you can't run properties without a slip of paper, you've got to have this. I said, well, how come I've run all this time without it? He said, well, how do you do your budget? I said, I do it here. I said, I know how much I earn, how much I'm going to earn. If I don't earn it, well, I don't spend as much. I said, no problem. I said, I've never. Oh, anyway, oh, we'll have to have a budget. I said, well, you want a budget, you've got to do it. And he, I gave the accountant permission to send him the information and Sam did the budget. I've never done a budget before or since. So I don't know whether that was an all-time budget or what, but it worked anyway. There's just a few more things I want to... I'm not going to keep you too long. Um, you know, friends, we know about Jesus by reading the Bible. But is that enough? We know about him. Plenty of people know about him. But it's not about knowing Jesus, it's about, about knowing about him, it's about knowing him. And we've got to look past the pages and know Jesus personally. That's the only way that we will follow him and inherit eternal life. You know, there's a, just, a, just a couple of things I want to mention, then we'll finish. 
I asked God for strength and God gave me difficulties to make me strong. I asked God for wisdom and God gave me problems to learn to solve. I asked God for courage and God gave me dangers to overcome. I asked God for love and God gave me troubled people to help. I asked God for favours and God gave me opportunities to take. I asked God for prosperity and riches. Lord, make me rich. And God said, I will give you brain and brawn to work. You know, woe betide, I received nothing that I wanted. I received everything I needed. My prayers have been answered. And you know, I just want to share a thought with you this morning. This is a theory I have, and this is how it goes. I read the Bible, God said it, I believe it, end of story. All the way my Saviour leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by earth in him to dwell. For I know whatever before me, Jesus doeth all things well. Shall we further praise God this morning? For the use of hymn number 516, hymn number 516.